Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Joe Cable, and he is the Baird Term Assistant Professor of Psychology at Penn. Uh, he completed his bachelor's degree uh, in chemistry at Emory University and received his PhD right here at Penn in the neuroscience graduate group. Uh, his lab studies how people make choices and the neurophysiological mechanisms underlying decision making. Uh, this work combines approaches from experimental economics, uh, the psychology of judgment and decision making, as well as social and cognitive neuroscience uh, to help understand how people make trade-offs between the present and the future. Uh, he has several publications in highly respected journals, and his work has been featured in the New York Times. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Joe Cable. Hey. Thank, thanks for having me here, and thanks for that great introduction. Um, so I, I want to talk to you today about decision making. And specifically, I want to talk to you uh, today about why people quit, why they give up uh, on the long-term goals that they've been working towards, often in favor of short-term rewards that had always been available to them. Now, this is a behavior that will be familiar to any of you who have already made and broken your 2014 New Year's resolutions. <laughs> Um, it will also be a behavior that's familiar to anyone who, like me, struggles with this dilemma, uh, which is that I'd like to have washboard abs, but I also have a very wicked sweet tooth. Now, uh, from a decision theory perspective, we should recognize at the outset that there would be nothing inherently irrational about prioritizing one of these goals over the other. If I decided I wanted to restrict my caloric intake in order to work towards those washboard abs, that would be fine. Um, if I decided that a couple of extra pounds was fine in order to enjoy the moment and get to have dessert, um, that would be fine as well. Uh, but it is a little puzzling when I say, I'm going to start a diet, and I'm going to work towards those washboard abs, and I persist in that choice for months or weeks or days, and then, you know, dessert comes around, and I have a look at the chocolate cake, and I say, eh, you know, all that stuff I said about the diet, forget about it. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, and, and you know, this is the behavior that we'd like to understand. Um, and, and it's puzzling because if I was just going to have the chocolate cake in the end, why didn't I save myself <laughs> all, the, all the effort of persisting in this choice if I wasn't going to reach my goal in the end of it? Um, and uh, now, if you look in our culture, the explanation for this kind of behavior is surprisingly one that, that strangely enough, both St. Augustine and Freud uh, would agree on. And the explanation they would give you is that there's some fundamental limitation in the human cognitive mechanism that keeps us from being able to reach our long-term goals. Whether that's you know, the flesh being weak, or whether that's the id, or whether that's a self, uh, you know, a, 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 a self-control strength that depletes with time, they believe in a fundamental limitation. I'm going to hope to convince you of an alternative view that recognizes that there can be hidden rationalities in quitting. Uh, that looks at the function that behavior might be trying to serve. And I think by taking that viewpoint, um, we come to some novel suggestions about how we might be able to encourage persistence in those situations where we'd like to see it. Now, our work takes as a, um, a, a jumping off point a set of experiments by a psychologist, uh, Walter Mischel. Many of you may have heard of these experiments. Uh, what he did in this set of experiments was take a four-year-old, bring them into a room, set in front of that child two rewards, one that's more preferred, say three marshmallows, and another that's less preferred, say one marshmallow, and say, you can have the more preferred reward if, now I'm going to leave the room now, and if you can wait until I come back, you can have the more preferred reward. But sometimes I'm gone for a really long time, and I understand that, and if you're ever sick of waiting, um, you can call me back, and you can have the one marshmallow instead. And what he sees, there's lots of very um, uh, cute YouTube videos if you, you want to see these, this experiment online. What he sees is that all the kids start waiting for the delayed reward, and they, and they try their hardest to wait it out until the experimenter comes back. But the majority of them give in and, and bring the experimenter back in and take the one marshmallow instead in the end. Now, we think that the temporal structure of this experiment captures the temporal structure of the kind of persistence dilemmas that um, many of us face in the real life. Uh, because 
for the kid in, the, in Michelle's experiments, those three marshmallows, they don't know when the experimenter's coming back. They don't know when they're gonna reach that goal. But that one marshmallow is always available immediately to them. And I think this maps on to dilemmas like my dilemma. When I start that diet, I don't know when I'm gonna have washboard abs. Uh, but in the world that we live in, chocolate cake is pretty much always immediately available to me with a little bit of effort. So what should you do when you face this kind of intertemporal uh, choice dilemma? It turns out that what you should do in this dilemma hinges critically on what you believe are the possible times that that reward that you're waiting for might arrive at. Now to talk you through it, I'm gonna show you a couple of movies. Um, so one possibility is that you might believe that the awaited reward is gonna occur at a very specific point in time you know, and maybe you're a little bit off, so maybe, you know, maybe it's likely to come at that time, but it could come a little bit earlier or a little bit later. Another way of saying that is that you have a Gaussian belief about the time at which that delayed reward is going to occur. It's most likely here, but it could happen a little earlier or a little later with less probability. I'm plotting here the probability density as a function of time. Now what I'm going to show you is how, uh, so already illustrated here is your prediction about when the reward occurs, that's the gold line. Um, and I'm going to show you how that prediction about when the reward occurs changes as you wait through time and rule out all those early possibilities that you thought had some lesser probability. And I'm also going to show you how the distance between you, which is going to be illustrated with a black bar, and your predicted time of reward, which is illustrated with this gold bar, changes as a function of time. The amount of time you predict that you have remaining until you get that uh, uh, awaited goal. And what you see is that as you move through time, if you start with Gaussian beliefs and you rule out those early time periods, while well, the reward hasn't come yet, your predicted time of when the reward does occur is going to get pushed farther and farther back. But you're always getting closer to it. The distance between you and that reward, the amount of time you think you have left, is always getting smaller as you wait. And this is our intuition about waiting. If we think something's coming in three minutes and we've waited one minute, we're closer to it. However, a very different situation obtains if instead you start with a, a heavy-tailed belief about when that awaited reward will occur. And what I mean by heavy-tailed is, oops, sorry. Um, what I mean by heavy-tailed is that uh, there's a large probability, there's a, a, some probability that the reward will come very soon, and then also a non-zero probability that the reward will also come at some very later point in time. And here what you see is that as you move through time, the reward is getting farther and farther away from you. The predicted time you have left remaining is increasing as a function of the time that you've waited. The intuition here is that in this world, the reward could come quickly or it could come uh, at a very long time constant. And the longer that you wait without the reward coming, the more likely it is that you're in the long world as opposed to the short world. Now this is a very nice mathematical idea, in, in, uh, and, and it could explain why people quit wait, and when they're waiting for their uh, delayed rewards to pay off. Because if you started out with heavy tail beliefs, you'd reach some point where that reward is getting farther and farther and farther away, and now, even though it was worth waiting for initially, it's no longer wait, worth waiting for. Um, and this idea could, ex so this idea could explain quitting, but do people really hold heavy tailed expectations? Now, one reason people might hold heavy-tailed expectations is because the distribution of payoff times is a heavy tail. Um, my favorite example of something in the real world that has a heavy-tailed distribution is the, like, the time at which someone's going to respond to your email. <laughs> and I think we all have reached that point in time when we're no longer waiting for the response to come in. The other reason why people might have uh, heavy-tailed expectations is because that's the set of expectations you should have if you're given no other information, there, and there are theoretical arguments for that. But do people actually hold them? So the first thing we did was ask people, what are your expectations? We said, you've been waiting in a bunch of situations that commonly are thought to involve self-control. You've been waiting for a delayed uh, reward to occur. You've been waiting this long. How much longer do you think it's going to be? So for example, we asked people about the diet situation. You've been on a diet for a certain period of time. It hasn't worked yet. How much longer do you think it's going to be until it pays off? 
And what we see is the time that they predict they have remaining until it pays off increases as a function of the time that we say you've been working towards it without success. And this is the signature of starting out with heavy-tailed expectations. If you remember that movie, time left increases as a function of time elapsed. Similarly, if we ask people about practicing the piano in order to uh, play a piece without uh, uh, mistakes, or you're running to improve your running time, or you're studying to improve your score, the amount of time that you think you have left to, until you reach that goal increases as a function of the time that you've been working towards that goal without seeing results. This suggests that one reason why people may have trouble persisting in these situations is because their expectations tell them that unlimited persistence is not a good thing. The next question uh, we wanted to ask was whether people can learn the statistics of the environment and adjust persistence accordingly. So can we change this? If people start out with heavy tail beliefs or they start out with Gaussian beliefs, can we change it? So having measured temporal beliefs, now we're going to try to manipulate them. And to do that, we brought uh, subjects into the lab and had them uh, do a cognitive task. And this task was very simple. Uh, subjects on each trial of the experiment were given a token. The token was initially worth nothing, but all of the tokens would eventually mature to be worth some money. And if you waited until that token matured, you could sell it back to us and get money. However, if at any point in time you were sick and tired of waiting for that particular token to mature, you could sell it back to us, not get any money, but you could get another token. And your goal in this, exper in this experiment was to try and make as much money as possible um, uh, throughout the course of the experiment by selling tokens back to the experiment. Now, subjects face two different payoff distributions of tokens. In one situation, the payoff distribution was uniform. So there was an equal probability of the token paying off from 5, 10, 15, 20 seconds, and so forth. In the other condition, the payoff distribution was heavy-tailed. So half of the time, the tokens paid off before 20 seconds, and the other half of the time, they only paid off after waiting for 90 seconds. And the tokens in the two conditions were denoted with different colors, and the subjects played with one color token for 10 minutes, and then played with another color token for another 10 minutes, and so on and so forth throughout the experiment. Now, the strategy that you should use for these two kinds of tokens is dramatically different. For the uniform tokens, your strategy should be to never, ever, ever give up on waiting. Because once you've waited a little bit of time, that uh, you should always wait until all of the tokens pay off. Your strategy in the heavy-tailed condition should not be to be persistent for an unlimited period of time, but rather your strategy should be to wait for 20 seconds and then give up if the token hasn't paid off and move on to the next one. So our first question was whether people learned that from experience. From experience with the temporal statistics, did they learn to be as persistent as possible in one environment and to have limited persistence in the other environment? And what I'm showing here is the survival rate, the likelihood that the subject's still waiting for the token to pay off as a function of elapsed time in the two environments. What you see is there's very little difference over the first 15 seconds or so. People are, are pretty persistent in both the uniform and the heavy-tailed environment. But after that, persistence drops off dramatically. For the purple tokens in the heavy-tailed environment, people are mostly quitting after about 20 seconds, whereas persistence is maintained in the uniform environment. People are mostly staying put and waiting all the way through the end uh, for the green tokens. Now, the subjects who were doing this experiment were actually doing it um, in an fMRI scanner, so we could also look at their uh, brain activity while they were um, uh, uh, in the two conditions. And uh, the question that we wanted to ask about the brain activity was whether there's neural evidence that people are dynamically reevaluating rewards as time passes. My uh, suggestion to you is that as people wait, they're continually reassessing how, how, you know, how valuable would it be me, for me to continue to wait for this delayed reward versus how valuable would it be for me to quit and move on to the next try. And can we get evidence for that? Well, the two things that we would need in order to test that idea, one is we need to have a brain region where activity reflected someone's evaluation of their chosen item. And it turns out that there are lots of imaging studies now 
um, and we've done a meta-analysis of over 200 of them that suggests that this region of the brain, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, shown here, that the brain activity that we can measure with fMRI, that brain activity reflects how positively someone evaluates the item that they've currently chosen. In addition to test this idea, we need not just a place to look, but also what to look for. Um, and here we can capitalize on decision theory to, to figure out in, this, uh, in these two environments, how does the value of the token that you currently have change as a function of time? And that's shown here on the right. For the green tokens in the uniform condition, the value of the token you currently have is always rising as a function of time because the, the time at which that token pay off, pays off is always getting closer and closer to you. In contrast, the purple tokens in the heavy-tailed condition have some value for the first 20 seconds, but that's largely flat, and then it drops off after that time point because at that time point, that token basically is, is, not, is worthless to you. You should get rid of it and move on to the next one. So the way that we tested this was to look for any parts of the brain where there was a uh, difference um, as a function of time um, in, uh, uh, in that region. Um, and we, so we could have seen any area of the brain express any kind of difference as a function of time across the two conditions. However, we only saw one area where there was a significant interaction. That area was in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And the form of that interaction was exactly the form that we would have predicted. Over the first 10 seconds, we see that brain activity in this area is basically recovering from the previous trial. But then after that, you see that activity increases in the uniform condition and remains stable in the heavy-tailed condition. Exactly as we would predict if this area reflects your, your evaluation of the current token and how that evolves over time in the, differentially in the two conditions. So in wrapping up, um, uh, I hope that I haven't given you too negative of a view that quitting is rational and let's all go out and quit everything now, <laughs> give up. Um, uh, I think the point of this, uh, rather, is to say uh, if we think about these kind of dilemmas the way that a systems neuroscientist would uh, and look for the function of the behavior that we're investigating, it actually suggests um, uh, some novel ways now, once we've understand the function, in which uh, we can reverse engineer the situation and perhaps encourage greater persistence by making situations more like that uniform condition in those places where we would like people to persist longer in, in the pursuit of their long-term goals. Thanks. Hey, uh, thanks so much. I was just curious about the uh, about the token game. Mm -hmm. um, so if people know that they have, say, 10 minutes to make as much money as possible versus don't necessarily know how much time they have to make as much money as possible, does that affect their behavior in this game? Yeah, it would affect their, their behavior because the, the reason why you, uh, so basically we made the limited time period so that we could enforce a uniform cost of time. Um, and uh, if you don't enforce that, um, uh, then, then basically, you, yeah, the subject shouldn't quit in either condition. Uh, they should try and make as much money off the current token as possible because there's no cost, um, there's no cost of waiting, right? So by making it a limited period of time, you impose a cost of waiting. Um, and we think that that's realistic. In the, you know, in the real world, there's always some opportunity cost for your time. Um, I think this was very interesting to me. Thank you. Um, it it kind of makes me think a lot about behavioral finance. Uh -huh. And uh, it's a much lengthier time horizon, I guess, for retirement savings. But a lot of young people are hesitant to save for retirement because it's such a distant goal. And I don't know what to really call that. Not heavy-tailed, the opposite of heavy-tailed, I guess. Um, because you're expecting the reward to come eventually. But it's so far away, you feel like you can put it off. And I don't know if you've ever looked into anything like that. Like, the, the reward comes, it's 
so much, so far away, so distant, it doesn't seem interesting now. Mm -hmm. And in reality, with compounding interest, it makes a lot more sense to do it now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why do people... Uh, that, that I, I, uh, that's the, the exact topic that the other half of my lab studies, <laughs> yeah, actually, which is uh, uh, how does the time at which the reward pays off affect its value? Um, and the, what we know is that people uh, discount delayed rewards. They're considered less valuable than the same reward that you get more immediately. And we've looked a lot at, at individual differences in, in discounting and how those relate to differences in brain function. Um, and interestingly, the same area, this medial prefrontal area, seems to uh, reflect individual differences in discounting behavior as well. Um, and you know, behaviorally, if you look at, so we've, we give people financial decisions, and certainly what you see is that uh, we're not, uh, we haven't evolved to interact with financial institutions, <laughs> right? And so, you know, we exhibit discount rates that might make sense if you're thinking about, you know, discounting food rewards in the wild, but don't make sense if you're discounting money that's going to sit in a bank and earn compound interest. Um, so I think that's part of the explanation for, for, for that. One more. Um, I have a question about um, the part of the trials for the heavy tail distribution. Did you ever look at trials where the subject kind of made a mistake or kept waiting instead of when they should have really given up? Um, and did the venture medial prefrontal cortex activity look like the uniform distribution trials? Yeah, so so that's an that's an interesting question in um, uh, what it, we don't really have enough data to look at that um, uh, because we, trained the subjects extensively before they got to the scanner, so there's not a lot of variability in their behavior. There's some variability across subjects, but very little variability within subjects. Um, so we'd have to run the experiment a little bit differently at an earlier point in time to, to get it to get it that, unfortunately. Thanks. 